Good afternoon and welcome to the author of the book that we are going to discuss this afternoon and uh, our distinguished panelists. Uh, before I uh, introduce the author and the panelists, uh, let me uh, first display the book that we are going to be discussing. Here we go. I hope you can see it. Here we go. Um, it's titled Portraits of Power, um, a half a century at, of being at the ringside. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very readable and informative book. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And um, I've, I am sure that our panelists will have a great deal to say uh, in terms of their reactions to, to the contents of the book. Uh, but uh, let me first introduce the author. Uh, who will have 10 to 15 minutes to discuss the book, uh, what he chose to put in it and what he chose to leave out. Uh, and uh, he will also tell us about the, uh, the message of the book. Um, although it is a work of recent economic history, um, it is um, of immense contemporary relevance uh, because, as you know, after COVID, all over the world, there has been a global recognition that governments matter, that government and governance is extremely important uh, for the solution of the most pressing problems, the immediate problem being COVID and its elimination and restoring the world economy to what it was before COVID, and the longer term concern, of course, being climate change. Mr. N.K. Singh uh, is uh, someone who has seen government and governance from every conceivable angle. Uh, he started his career as an officer in the Indian Administrative Service and uh, served a full term going from 1964 to 2001. After that, he became a member of the Planning Commission and had a view of governance in the states from the center. And then he was deputy chair chairman of the Bihar State Planning Board from where he had a view of the center from an important state in India, a large state, a popular state, and a very poor state. He then made a transition into politics and became a member of the Rajya Sabha, where he served for a full six-year term. During his membership of the Rajya Sabha, he was a member of the Public Accounts Committee, a body before which he had deposed when he was Revenue Secretary in the Ministry of Finance. So he has seen several organizations from both sides of the table. Most recently, he was chair of the 15th Finance Commission and uh, the commission just submitted its final report in November or so of 2020, just about when this book itself came out. On the 1st of February, the report was tabled in parliament along with the union budget. And uh, so we now know the contents of the report, although the book obviously does not refer to the contents, which emerged into the public domain only on the 1st of February this year. Mr. N.K. Singh will speak to us about his book, about what he wanted to convey in his book about governance and government, what he learned and what he would like us to learn from the book. Over to you, Mr. Singh. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, thank you, Indira, for those warm words. Uh, I'm also grateful to the two panelists. Uh, I find Rakesh is here. Thank you, Rakesh, for sparing the time. Thank you, Prachi, for uh, sparing a very valuable part of what uh, would otherwise be doing. Both Rakesh and you are exceedingly busy in your work. So is Indira. So first of all, my gratitude to all the panelists, my gratitude to the to the organizers and to the Indian, uh, India International Center, of which I have been uh, a member virtually from its uh, very inception. So I think that uh, a lot has been written by the book. Many of those who were generous enough to write uh, reviews of the book have also uh, extended their generosity by being panelists also. Indira, Prachi, Rakesh, uh, I'm missing Jessica, who had also collaborated in the book. Let me talk a little bit about the book before uh, really uh, I request uh, panelists uh, and the anchor 
to say uh, something about the book. What is this book about? First and foremost, why did I choose to write such a book? And what is the context of that choice? I wrote the book because of two reasons. Because I felt that I had seen a lot, I had participated in a lot. There were dramas. These dramas preceded my own forays into public policy. Some of it I picked up from my father's time in terms of what I saw, in terms of what I heard, and what captivated my interest. It's about that period about which not much has been written. I wish more was written about it. I'll come to that in a minute. But more importantly, I felt that a generation of civil servants who had played a key role in active policy making of my father's generation, particularly, let us say iconic figures in civil service like LK Jha, popularly known as LK, uh, or LP Singh, popularly known as just LP, or others had seen the shaping and convergence of India's economic policy, its struggle before, just before its independence, and then the emergence of the Planning Commission in those initial phases. None of them wrote even one line on that critical period of pre-independence and just the post-independence conflicts, strategies, resolutions, and our challenges. I felt that uh, before my memory fades off more, before all this period is completely forgotten about and before we have to rush to the gazetteer to find out uh, some of these details, perhaps uh, I could pin some of these ideas out. This book, in a certain sense, therefore, has three or four components. The reason why I said that I want to come back to this subject, is let me come back to it straight away, is that there is a chapter in this book which deals with the emergence of the Prime Minister's office and the, and the reshaping of the dynamics between the Prime Minister's office and the Cabinet office. And that this is interplay of power in the real sense of the term, which shaped the governance matrix significantly. I found that uh, there's a great deal of interest in this particular chapter. Much was written about it. In fact, I was privileged to be invited by the Prime Minister's Office to address all officials of the Prime Minister's Office and the other key secretaries, which went into great details on the evolving dynamics between the Cabinet Office and the Prime Minister's Office, which is the centerpiece of our governance architecture. The book uh, basically then traces the evolution of India's economic policies from a highly controlled economy, which it was when I was a field officer. Then, of course, the challenges which it confronted in dealing with successive bouts of balanced payments crisis, in terms of being able to manage food security, in terms of being able to conserve, preserve, and reinforce our newly won independence. Why did we adopt such a policy of a controlled economy? Was it a hangover of Fabian socialism? Was it a hangover of the original people who were responsible in our freedom struggle? Why did India select that model of growth? Some of it is touch uh, per se in this. But thereafter, of course, the emergence of India from a highly controlled economy, given the compulsions of successive balanced payments crisis, the tentative reforms in the 80s, and more significant reforms in the early 1991, leading to far-reaching changes in India's trade policy as an important driver. And then industrial policy, which was an important driver. Rakesh, if he ever chose to write his autobiography, would really have a lot to say on the dynamics of the deregulation of India's over-controlled industrial regulatory regime, and what it had done to stifle private entrepreneurship. I trace a bit of that. I trace the chronology of events of the 1991 crisis, 
what I call the playbook, almost a day-to-day -day account of what happened, how we reacted, how we addressed them, and how we want to, wanted to get away with the least possible cost. Has it been to our advantage? More can be debated on this. I remember once that uh, when by almost parting no, nothing in return, we walked out of the balance payments crisis, so to say, with a very light haircut in 1993. It is a moment of celebration. Should we have celebrated or should we have had a deeper haircut? I will comment on this a little later. As we go on, this book also deals with the years of, in the evolution of India's taxation policy in the more or less static uh, status quo in the expenditure management and expenditure outcome policy. Then the importance of the Vajpayee era in the governance Patrick would feed up India's telecom sector, whose full potential we are beginning to hopefully realize now is a long way to go as technology has changed so dramatically in terms of the forays into 4G, now talking about 5G, into machine learning, artificial intelligence, internet of things, and its application over a much wider area of economic activity, from health to agriculture, to education, and to almost every aspect of economic activity. That was unleashed happily during the period of what has come to be known as the Vajpayee era. And then this great road connectivity, which has uh, the National Highway Development Program, I trace the history of that, how it happened, why it happened, what were the factors, and which has improved certainly our internal connectivity in, an ex in a, a very significant way. Then the era in the Planning Commission, where uh, I was privileged to chair the Foreign Investment Committee, and whose recommendations got almost accepted in total, of freeing up the caps on foreign investment uh, in a very significant way. We had decisively moved away, and Rakesh will remember this very closely, decisively moved away from an era where we hesitatingly were talking of foreign investment to not only accepting them, but enthusiastically welcoming them and being able to catalyze that huge potential. That period was a period of the Planning Commission. My failed efforts to bring about a more abiding reforms in the power sector, but certainly attempts which were made at that time, that's the Planning Commission chapter. My chapter on the, uh, as Indira described, as Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission of Bihar, or what was known as the, the Deputy Chairman of the Bihar Planning Board, each state had replicated uh, the Planning Commission in some form or the other to have its annual state plan to see how little of the change had percolated to a comparatively, or rather, I would say, a very backward state. <laughs> bottom of the development pyramid. Six years in the Rajya Sabha. These six years were very educative for me. I really say that it's one thing to view parliament from outside, from the officer's gallery or from really being in the minister's personal staff to be par partly sometimes to go to the central hall, but to be a member of the either house of parliament is a unique experience which had its own dynamics. I deal with some of that. I deal with some of the important issues on which uh, I had the privilege to in make interventions during the debate in the Raj Sabha. Some of them have been relegated to history. But surprisingly, many of them are still alive. And in that section, which I deal with my experience in Parliament, I have made some important changes on the reforms of parliamentary processes and parliamentary procedures. Reforms in the budgetary process, in the budget making process, a greater accountability of the executive by, by improved parliamentary superintendents and what can be done to improve the overall outcome of the rules by which Parliament has its, has its debate and has its discussions. Then I move on to a period which is most contemporary, the issue of center-state relations in the broadest sense of the term, 
an experience which enabled as a chairman of the Finance Commission to see India in a way in which very few of us would, would have seen India in from the beginning from the panchayats, panchayat are the institutions, the varied nature of these institutions in say Arunachal, in say Mizoram, to say someone more developed like in Kerala, to see it really in its micro details, the issues in the assignment of the overall resources of the government between the needs of the union and the needs of the state. What are the conflicts? What kind of balances are necessary? Is a perfect consistency possible? And what would be the, the factors which would lead to an improved modeling and reinforcement of federal trust? Some of that is also dealt with in my last chapter. But as Indira pointed out, the last chapter is not so much about the very remote past or the proximate past and or about even the current, but a lot of it is about the future. The chapter on pandemic and beyond deals in a certain sense with the unfinished agenda of India's economic reforms, some of which had got relocated because as I said, we got away with a light haircut. Some of this thereafter, more difficult structural reforms got increasingly relegated into conflicts in the political domain, which remain unresolved. Some of that I have dealt with. I have dealt with environment and the emerging challenges of climate change, with the need to structure the health infrastructure in a significant way, and what this pandemic has taught us in more ways than one, in terms of what people call the reset button, in many aspects of our economic activity, social security systems, in the management of using technology for education or imparting better health care. Some of this have been dealt with in my chapter on pandemic and beyond. And what are the measures which are needed to enable India to reach its true growth potential? We are nowhere near that, but uh, we need to persevere. So this book, in a certain sense, has a message, a message of legacy, a message of history, but in the end, a message of optimism, that we have achieved a lot from where we began. But there is still the lasting quest to grasp India's true growth potential as a nation and to restore us to the positions and heights of civilization, which in the past, India was fortunate to enjoy. Finally, uh, just said the book also gave me an opportunity to talk about my uh, uh, non-policy related pursuits. Uh, I, I take great pride in them. I'm an avid lover of Indian classical music. I have been able to say some of these things in my book. I'm an avid gardener and sometimes felt that I had once joked with my parents that if I failed to get into any decent service, uh, what would I do? And uh, they asked me, what would you do? And I said, maybe the job of the chief gardener in the Raj Bhavan here on the chief minister's residence or in the Harding Park in Patna would be still vacant for me to apply for that. That's also a passion. As also my passion for the need for alternative medical systems. I, my maternal grandfather, who lived till 93, never took an allopathic medicine. He gave me a whole library of homeopathic medicines, which encouraged me to read those medicines. Very fascinating account of uh, what alternative medicines can do. I not only take homeopathic medicines, I prescribe homeopathic medicines, and I'm passionate to that. It also, therefore, the book enabled me an opportunity to deal with my passions, to deal with my hobbies, which fortunately have kept me ticking, kept me alive. And it has enabled me to discharge my public obligations by a happier blend of private life and public life. And of course, my family, which has been 
of such great support, particularly my wife. I can never repay her debt. My children, who, about whom I mentioned in my book. So I will stop here, Indira, and uh, I will take up in any manner and any format which are appropriate, you being the anchor uh, for today's event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was an excellent summary. I forgot to mention when I was introducing you that before you joined the IAS, uh, you taught economics uh, for a period at St. Stephen's College in Dell University. Uh, so I can see from the summary you just gave us that you must have been a very, very good teacher. Uh, I also neglected to mention that you were the economic counselor at the Indian Embassy in Tokyo uh, for uh, a, a time. And of course, as chairman of the 15th Finance Commission, your, your training as an economist uh, must have been extremely useful um, as you evaluated the advice that you got from a number of sources. Uh, with, with me are two of the featured panelists for this discussion. Uh, the third who couldn't join us, Jessica Seddon. Uh, she's on the east coast of the US and um, she uh, fell ill. Uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't join us because of that, not because of the early hour at which she would have had to get up uh, if uh, she had joined us. So we do have with us Prachi Mishra and Rakesh Mohan. Let me start with Prachi because she's the youngest. Um, and uh, because this book is about history and legacy. Uh, and so it would be useful for me and for all the viewers, I think, uh, to see what a young person like Prachi, uh, who was uh, uh, probably in school uh, when all these uh, changes that Mr. N.K. Singh describes were going on, um, what she thinks of the book, what it tells us about how we morphed uh, from um, a, a socialist um, uh, structure uh, to what we have today. I don't know what we can call what we have today, but certainly we have changed uh, from what we were before 1991. Quickly about Prachi Mishra. She's a very, very distinguished young economist. Presently, she's with the IMF Research Department, where she is the co-editor co of the IMF Economic Review. Uh, she is still in Mumbai, uh, although she's employed by the IMF. Uh, she's working virtually for the IMF and, and will move to Washington when the IMF opens its doors. Um, prior to, to taking up this assignment, she was the uh, chief economist with Goldman Sachs for India. Uh, and uh, prior to that, uh, she had a lot of stints in government, including as a member of the FRBM committee, which was chaired by Mr. N.K. Singh. Uh, Prachi, in your uh, review of the book, um, I remember that you um, took issue with the author uh, about uh, the whole business of lateral entry uh, into government uh, at all levels, um, getting technocrats like Rakesh Mohan into the government um, uh, to supplement or perhaps even supplant uh, bureaucrats like Mr. N.K. Singh. Probably you had in mind supplement rather than supplant, but um, I'll let you go. Prachi? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajaraman. First, um, I would like to begin by uh, thanking the Indian International Center and all the organizers uh, for inviting me. I think it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be part of this distinguished panel to discuss Mr. N.K. Singh's uh, autobiography. I have to start with the uh, usual disclaimer that, you know, whatever I'll be saying comprises my personal views rather than views with the IMF. Um, let me, you know, before I get into this issue of lateral entry, etc., I do have, uh, you know, a number of other things uh, to say about the book. So maybe I can spend some time uh, on that, Dr. Rajaraman, if that's OK with you. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Um, of course. So let me just start by saying that, look, the book has indeed a wealth of information you know, telling us how the country is run or has been running for over half a century. So I, you know, thoroughly enjoyed reading the book and would recommend it highly for anyone interested, not only in Indian economic policy, but the whole policy process. And, um, you know, on a lighter vein, there's a saying that um, politics is the art of making uh, possible impossible. I think what you really get to understand from Mr. Singh's magnum opus is uh, a clear out outlining of the opposite. That is, you know, uh, bureaucracy, particularly in India, or more generally in democracies, I would say large democracies, is also about the art of making impossible possible. 
So, uh, I mean, definitely, you know, this landscape of a high profile career in India's bureaucracy and policy making is what makes the book, um, you know, so unique and very special to read. So, um, you know, hearty congratulations uh, to Mr. N. Kissing on the book. So with this brief um, you know, introduction, I would like to make uh, three uh, specific points. Um, I think the first one is that you know, the book actually beautifully illustrates um, you know, the complexities of the Indian civil service. And um, as I said in my review as well, you know, the, uh, the autobiography of an Indian bureaucrat and policymaker could very well be a vivid biography of the Indian civil service itself. And a perfect material for you know, a yes, Prime Minister type series set in India. Um, so, 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 so I found you know, many similarities to the classic series relating to some of the structural factors influencing how a government runs. Yet I, you know, I found fundamental differences too, you know, from where Sir Humphrey Appleby described, uh, you know, prescribed to Minister Hacker that, look, it's not your job to run the department, it's the official's job. So I think you know, from the beautiful anthology that this book is, it really brings out vividly um, the nitty gritty of Indian bureaucracy, working with um, uh, you know the politician in a close knit, and um, there are indeed you know unique complexities that characterize um, the Indian civil service that comes out in the book, and an autobiography like this reminds us of really the impossible that is India and how civil servants create the possible within that impossibility, and just to give you a few um, you know instances from the book, you know going through the land records titles and tenancy rights written in Persian during his first posting in Madhepura, or you know, numerous instances which Mr. Singh talked about as well of negotiations with the International Monetary Fund uh, post the BOP crisis, and also um, you know, with Suzuki in Japan leading to the creation of the iconic Maruti Suzuki in India, was really eye-opening. Definitely instances of creating, I think, possible within the impossible. Um, I think just to mention also uh, a couple of other classic which anecdotes which I really found classic was about um, uh, you know about the interaction between civil service and politics was you know one of them was the instruction to Mr. Singh by a superior to create grand confusion in the brief on commerce related issues for the NAM summit in Zambia and to quote uh, you know a line from the book till you create enough confusion there will be little scope for me to sort out the mess. Another classic one was, you know, a statement by um, the former Prime Minister Vajpayee post his announcement of the Golden Quadrilateral, where he noted that Maharaj, aap logo ne ghoshna to karwai di, aap banwa bhi dijiye. So I, you know, these two I think uh, really struck me. Um, with this, let me move on to my, uh, you know, second point, um, uh, where, um, and I think Mr. Singh also talked about it. I think uh, what is uh, very striking in the book is Mr. N.K. Singh's central tenet of optimism, optimism, and optimism that really flows through the book. And, um, and somehow, I think I, uh, you know, just to draw an, an analogy, you know, embedded in his ultimate optimism might peculiarly be a logic if I consider, you know, a statement by G uh, Joan Robinson, who quoted, the frustrating thing about India is that, you know, whatever you can rightly say about India, the opposite is also true. So I think the unbounded possibility frontier that Mr. Singh has in the case of India is definitely the product of the long and illustrious career that is that had him, you know, dealing with several crises at the micro and macro levels, which he also referred to in the introduction. I really like the fact that he's eternally optimistic um, about India. He believes in solutions to problems, and um, if you think about it, you know, India's polity has generally been very left-oriented, and markets have been a no-go area, not only. If from the book, but you know, based on numerous exchanges and interactions, you know, I can say this with conviction that unlike several of his contemporaries, he's not at all suspicious of markets and the private sector. Um, and it's it, 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 it is ironical that only now in Parliament, you know, to draw an analogy from the trade economics literature, there's a discourse whether private sector is a stumbling block or a building block for the economy and India's massive population. Um, I should also add that you know while Mr. Singh um, favors rules to discretion, as um, you know the former can offer support and signal commitment, at the same time I think from my experience he has always preferred non-corner solutions to allow for flexibility and accommodation. And as you said, you know this was evident um, in the recommendation to allow the very much contentious escape clause in the FRBM review committee and in the range of fiscal deficit by the Finance Commission both of which he chaired and 
I had the privilege of being associated with. So, I, you know, I think the portraits of power could very well be christened as the portraits of power of balancing. With this, let me move on to my uh, last comment, which relates, uh, Dr. Rajaraman, to the question um, you asked about, you know, civil service, lateral entry, etc. Um, I think, you know, a puzzle that emerges after reading this book is, you know, why has the Indian civil service not attracted, um, uh, you know, uh, anyone from Mr. Singh's future generations, despite you know, the strong family tradition? And of course, there could be family specific factors, etc. Um, you know, but for such an illustrious family of civil servants, I think the bigger question is, is it really symptomatic of something larger? And I particularly wonder, you know, if this is reflective of the fact that, look, the global ecosystem has changed and so have aspirations of the younger generations. And, you know, it may suggest that perhaps the best and the brightest would no longer mechanically or by brute force victim of parents opt for jobs unless employers proactively attempt to attract them and not only attract them, you know, but be able to retain them with an enabling and stimulating environment where they where they can grow in their careers. And I, I, I feel that indeed there may be need for some structural changes um, here. And not to delve into this issue more than what you know, data and evidence is there. To be fair, I think uh, Ms. Mr. Nk Singh casts his faith in the in the crop of the next generation bureaucrats. You know, judging them as very well skilled and enterprising, if not in the book, in many terms, in as many terms, but definitely in public conversation. Let me say that you know I'm also equally puzzled by the fact uh, you know that the book talks about. Uh, the ideal model as that of quote unquote economic mandarins, um, along with again quote unquote occasional lateral entrance in India civil service to get things done. I think, given my experience in you know several large public and private sector organizations, you know I just wonder you know why this distinction at all. You know both the global and Indian economies are becoming abundantly complicated. You know interlinked with increasing liquidity and depth of private markets. So, you know, I, in, I see the role of regulators perhaps as that of an enabler to enable, you know, labor markets to function efficiently, support competition and to create a level playing field and perhaps, you know, help create an environment for both entrants and incumbents to flourish. And with competition staring at us in such a gigantic way, in my view, I think uh, the take on this part of civil service in the would probably need some rethinking. And I find it particularly intriguing, let me say, for two reasons. One is it comes from one of the key architects and believers in India's drastic import liberalization of the 1990s. So one wonders you know, if opening goods market to international trade can increase competition and enhance efficiency and offset any short term costs, the same arguments would indeed apply to opening up of factor markets to domestic and global competition. And the second reason I'm particularly intrigued is Mr. Singh himself is a true modernizer. I have sat with him personally through many meetings. I think he loves fresh energy. He likes new ideas. He has been a strong advocate of inclusiveness and has actually gone out of the way in his efforts to blend the existing bureaucracy with new energy. With this, you know, let me just conclude and say that you know, autobiographies generally do not have a sequel. But in whichever form this fantastic book gets adopted, it should send the message that Mr. N.K. Singh has been a great enabler and a master of making impossible possible and not the other way around. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, Prachi. Um, that was terrific. Um, I will now call upon Rakesh Mohan, but first let me introduce him. Um, he was formerly a deputy governor at the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, subsequently, he moved to Yale University uh, for several years, where he was a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and taught macroeconomic policy. Uh, recently, he has uh, returned to, to, to Delhi uh, where prior to uh, going to the RBI, he had worked in government in very key capacities and was a major partner in the 1991 reforms, uh, particularly in industrial licensing. Now he is with what used to be called Brookings India, 
uh, but it has morphed into the Center for Social and Economic Progress. Uh, Rakesh Mohan is the president and distinguished fellow there. Um, he has known uh, the author for many years. Um, in 2016, he published, uh, he edited a, a volume uh, on um, the 25th anniversary of the 1991 reforms in which they had been partners. Um, and in that book, uh, there was a, 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 a paper uh, written jointly by Jessica Seddon, uh, who, as I said, couldn't uh, join us, unfortunately, and, and N.K. Singh. Uh, so they've known each other for many years. Uh, Rakesh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Indira. And thank you to uh, the Indian National Center and um, N.K. for including me in this uh, program. Uh, let me just start by first saying that uh, when, I, when I wrote a review of N.K.'s book, my preferred title was was bureaucrat, technocrat, politician, and bon vivant, non pareil. Because um, I think that captures everything that NK is, the book, and of course, himself. Um, I want to first uh, talk, just give one episode, which illustrates his human qualities, rather than all the superhuman qualities that uh, we've uh, all been talking about uh, that uh, just that um, <clears throat> Prachi mentioned and all the many official things they've done, which also I'll come back to. But I want to first start with the human qualities, a very small vignette, which is how I first met him in the 19, late 1980s, when I had uh, just joined the Ministry of Industry as Economic Advisor 1988-89. And there was a meeting that we held with state industry secretaries. And at that time, uh, uh, N.K. was back briefly as Bihar Industries Secretary. Um, of course, uh, it was a relatively boring meeting with all the state industries secretaries uh, uh, from, from the different states. But of course, uh, he stood out. I had, being, being a new entrant to the government and had all, uh, at that time also been away from the country for a long time, I had not known of his uh, prowess prior to that. Uh, but that's when I first met him. But then, you know, uh, like uh, four or five months later, I had one humble research officer in my office, the office of the economic advisor in the Ministry of Industry, who was from Bihar. And he pleaded with me if I could help him get a particular very low level job in the Bihar bureaucracy in his hometown, uh, whose name I forget. Um, I knew, of course, that getting even a low level government job in Bihar is almost impossible. But I said, OK, I'll try. I know, and the only person I know in the state of Bihar is Mr. N.K. Singh, who I just met. So I wrote to him, and you know, NK had not known me. Um, he clearly, obviously, there's nothing that, that this young person who I was wanting to help, he just did it. He just did it. He actually got that man the job that he wanted. I have no idea what he did. I assume that the way NK is in his generosity, he's forgotten this particular episode. But I will certainly never forget it. Um, let me then. Um, Come back to the question uh, that you started asking Prachi, without, started with asking Prachi, which was the issue between, between technocrats and bureaucrats. I mean, in a sense, um, NK is really a technocrat in disguise as a bureaucrat. Um, of course, uh, then he's also a politician in disguise, despite being a technocrat at heart. Uh, and of course, his love of life, whether it's to do with gardening, whether it's to do with music, uh, whether it's to do with photography, uh, and everything else, good things in life. But uh, <clears throat> the, the point, in a sense, is that uh, you should note who are the people who have written reviews of his book, mostly technocrats or technocrat bureaucrats. So uh, he, and all through his career in government, um, I think that he was the one who of us who came from outside the government. He encouraged us, each one of us, I think, at different points in time, whether it is Prachi in more recent years, whether it's me in much earlier years, and many, many others. That he, as Prachi says, he was always interested in new ideas and wanting to do the right thing, in a sense. So uh, I find it somewhat surprising that there should be any doubt on uh, his... Uh, on, on his view of government um, needing uh, technocrats, 
be they uh, uh, civil service people themselves who have great domain knowledge themselves or lateral entry people who have had acquired uh, domain knowledge uh, before coming to the government and then can 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 in some sense hit hit the ground running um one thing among various things that i wanted to mention is that um one of the, 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 sort of the one of the key reasons for nk's effectiveness at every level whether it was working in the state government whether in the central government whether as economic minister in japan uh, to the indian embassy in japan um whether as a participant in in, uh, in in a huge number of international gatherings whether as a participant uh, and real and an and, and actor in a sense uh, in the davos gatherings whether as chairman of finance commission whether as a member of parliament um, whether as a member of the planning commission whether as a member of prime minister vajpayee's uh, office a key thing that i think he made him so effective is that it's his warmth and personal style uh, which he brings in his relationships uh, i would say professional relationships to begin with in every sphere that he works in um and then of course each of these people become his personal friends and i think that this that the, the the anecdotes throughout the book are littered with each of these encounters who people he met professionally who he formed a warm professional relationship with uh, and then became personal friends but in but, but but this was sort of a smooth transition and you know you never felt that something was changing um and it is because of these this this ability to form very human relationships that makes him so effective people can trust him and he can trust them and i think that he has he 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 has he has gained from all of these these relationships and interactions whether it's in conferences whether it's in formal meetings which is then able is constantly absorbing information constantly thinking of what are the right things to do in in public policy um and what is remarkable to me because i can't do this is that he's equally comfortable in interacting and communicating with the best academic minds in the world and i've seen this through our meetings in stanford through our meetings at nimrana uh, every year for almost 20 years from the late 90s till a couple of years till, till a year back or so with domestic leaders and politicians at different levels local level state level central level uh, with international statesmen as he's described in the book with heads of domestic and international businesses musicians and artists i mean it is incredible um but that that's that it's it's this with all the substantive interactions and his personal relationships that he is then able to be effective in getting things done um the uh um the, the uh, uh, experience that he's had uh at different times uh in different sectors whether it's industrial policy whether it's uh, uh, trade policy um whether sometimes even a foreign policy um the um uh, being a member of of parliament being engaged in all the different areas that he mentions uh, in his book that he's constantly looking for what i would call rational technocratic policy and um i think this is uh, uh, this comes out right 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 through the book um the EU, and it it is also connected with what prachi mentioned that he is consistently positive we never hear a word of despair or disappointment through all the vicissitudes of economic policy making that india has gone through since 1991 and i think he is probably the only one uh, who has worked through all the highest levels with all the prime ministers over the last 30 years and that again uh, the, 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 again is evidence of his interest in, in continuing to make, make policy despite many differences that i'm sure he would have personally had with any of the prime ministers that he has he has worked with 
so um, um, he, 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 I wish there were at least five NK Singhs in India. And you can imagine that if you had five NK Singhs, how much better public policy would be. I'll stop here and maybe respond to any further questions if I have. Thank you very much, uh, Rakesh, for that very personal, warm uh, uh, description of your long uh, relationship with, with the author and of uh, everything that he represents, his optimism, his warmth. And I should also add his total unflappability. Uh, I think um, I've never seen uh, NK displaying uh, any sense of stress, whatever, although he has been in many, many stressful situations, some of which are described in the book. <clears throat> but I want to pick up again on the issue of technocrats and bureaucrats, because I think that's terribly important. As you know, uh, when the 1991 reforms happened, uh, that was the first time um, when um, the veil was lifted uh, from the private sector. Uh, it was revealed to be not the, the demon uh, that it had been presumed to be in socialist India and as a possible solution. Uh, to the poor functioning of the Indian economy. And uh, N.K. Singh in his book has also described how uh, the uh, telecommunication possibilities in India, the sector, was unleashed uh, during Prime Minister Vajpayee's time. Today, where we are, you know that many government departments, uh, both at central and state levels, have outsourced a lot of their functions to the private sector, uh, billing and such. And um, their experience uh, with billing by utility companies uh, that has been outsourced or the experience of scholarship students uh, uh, getting their, not getting their scholarships at all because this outsourced entity has made such a mess of the record um, suggests that our trans transition to outsourcing uh, uh, major services of the government to the private sector has not worked all that well. The second point I wanted to make in this connection is, it is no secret that the rollout of the GST in 2017 was severely obstructed by the poor performance of the GST portal. That portal had been outsourced to the most outstanding private sector IT company in the country. By contrast, the um, e-way bill structure was uh, kept within government with NIC and it has performed spectacularly well. And I think the reason is, um, you remember uh, when, when Prachi was speaking, uh, she referred to how people with talent today are no longer attracted to working in the bureaucracy. They gravitate to the private sector. And that is absolutely true. At the high levels of the private sector, you find exceptional talent. And as you know, many of them have also emigrated to the US where they had many, many important companies, including IT companies. But the problem is that at the lower levels in the private sector, uh, people are very poorly paid. There is very little regulation of labor conditions within the private sector, and that is the government's fault. And as a result, there is very high turnover. And uh, those of you who have uh, knowledge of what went on within the Ministry of Finance when GSD was being rolled out. And remember, the rollout of GSD was an extremely important um, uh, uh, milestone uh, in the economic history of our country. And this, this failure of this privately, uh, this outsourced privately managed and operated portal was a major reason why there was so much stumbling in the beginning. So um, uh, the, the, within the ministry, what they found was that every time that that uh, uh, outsourced entity uh, came into the ministry for discussions about the structuring of the portal, there would be a whole new set of people who would be coming in. The previous people who had come in for the meeting had all left the company. And so the ministry had to begin all over again, explaining the structure of the GST and, and what they wanted from the portal and so on. So uh, within the private sector, we have many of the problems that we have within the public sector as well. Uh, the private sector is no panacea. If we think there is corruption in government, there is corruption in the private sector. And I will just close very, very quickly now. Supposing today we are not the people we are privileged to be, but were uh, a fresh out of school uh, 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 job applicant. 
What do you do? You go to a portal and you find a listing of companies looking for people with, with qualifications that you have, whatever skills you have. You go to the address that they, they give you and you stand in line. When you stand in line there, there is a person who walks down the line and demands anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 rupees from each applicant. Now, this applicant, this job applicant, remember, comes typically from a very poor family from where it has been an enormous achievement to have put him or her through school, right up to the 12th standard. It's a long period. After that, when they're a job applicant, which means that they need money, they're being asked to pay money in cash with no receipt and no uh, refunding possibilities. And they're told that if they don't pay up, they have to leave the line. This is the reality of India today. So when we talk about India, when we when we feel optimistic about India, we have to know what it is like today. And I'm not talking about the poor below the poverty line. I'm talking about families above the poverty line. They're getting enough to eat. They come from families which have been able to put them through school. They're full of optimism. They're bright eyed. They want to be employed. And the first thing they face is corruption in the private sector. Mr. N.K. Singh, I would really like you to, to respond to this, if you would. Is, uh, is, is the author's mic on? Uh. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You're audible. Uh, yeah. All right. So I missed your last sentence. Is it a question addressed to me? Uh, in the yes. Uh, I just wanted you because to. Did the, you? Did you? Something wrong. Were you, able to, were you able to hear what I said about the experience of job seekers in the urban uh, labor market? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I just heard that. You wanted me to comment on that. Yes, yes, that's right. Or uh, just uh, comment on that. Or just you wanted me to comment on anything on, on on this last one? Well, there is no doubt that the fact that uh, we are under a demographic pressure that we are one point three billion people, uh, and that past rates of economic growth have. Uh, not been able to create employment opportunities which are suitable and embedded in the skills of the people who are seeking jobs has been a very important drag. And that is why I think that uh, as we go forward, I see no solution. I see no solution except uh, three things happen. Uh, I think first and foremost, we achieve much higher rates of economic growth necessary for being able to create a uh, 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 resources and investments for creating greater employment opportunities. But growth alone will not uh, lead to jobs because a lot of the more recent technologies are job displacing. Some of the things which I mentioned are not job creating. We therefore need to see how and in what way the quest for uh, higher levels of technology are also being able to create gainful employment opportunities. The fact that our skills uh, and our apprenticeship systems and our training at the curriculum for being able to create gainful employment opportunities have not kept pace and that demand has also been tardy, has only compounded the problem. So there is no one magic solution to this huge human uh, uh, urge for uh, not only livelihood, but if I may add, Indira, livelihood with dignity, because that is something which is proving to be elusive. And I also agree with you, the private sector is no panacea, even though the government sector, once you get into it, gives you job security. But uh, certainly then evaluation on your productivity is declining, but it certainly gives you job security. And that is why people go in for the government sector, because the private sector, really speaking at all levels, may not give you 
either uh, uh, terms of employment which are reasonable and very often not very dignified. But these are definitely challenges in being able, because the fact remains, I agree with you, Indira, it may get worse before it gets better. Because not only do we have this 1.3 billion people, I see no uh, population stabilization, but more importantly, it's a very young demography. And how do we therefore create uh, gainful employment opportunities uh, in this very, very young demographic profile? Uh, and what are a combination of economic policies which would be needed? I think that that is a very, very uh, challenging question. Uh, Rakesh, I want to ask you, uh, you've been at the RBI uh, where you were um, regulator uh, of the banking sector. Uh, you, you were in an institution which regulated the banking sector. And uh, as you know, uh, it is very important along with um, regulation to have good supervision because uh, without that, the best regulation can go awry. And since you were also the author, essentially, of the de uh, uh, license of, of, um, of our industrial structure, industrial uh, policy uh, in 1991. Tell me, what is a way by which we can um, regulate out of existence this terribly predatory structure that we have uh, facing job applicants uh, for uh, in uh, currently right now. It is a terrible situation. Uh, I, I know because I have heard from people who have stood in these lines and have surrendered their money until they gave away about 15,000 rupees, which is a huge amount of money for a family with, with one person that they want to place in the job, and then stop looking for jobs altogether. So Rakesh, I want a solution from you. So this is in, Indra, I don't have a particular solution to the specific problem that you mentioned, but I would like to talk about the larger problem you're talking about. Uh, which which I would label as the issue of state capacity. Um, if I may advertise a paper that has just been put on CSEP website yesterday called Third Generation of Reforms. And it's the third, you may ask, what are the first two generations? The first generation um, uh, was really the, the economic policies that were put in effect after independence immediate after independence with uh, self-reliance, uh, import substitution, et cetera, planning and so on. Second generation was the 1991 reforms and everything else that happened in the last 25, 30 years. And the third generation I'm saying is that in the 91 reforms, we tried to do everything we could to empower the private sector to do what it can do best. What we have not done in the bargain is to empower the public sector, and I don't mean public sector businesses. I do also believe that government has no business being in business. By public sector, I mean the whole of the government, regulatory authorities, reserve bank, etc. That what we have not done in the last 30 years is to, is to strengthen the government at all levels, from the local to the top, including regulatory agencies, to do what they must do to deliver public services and regulation, which then enables the private sector to flourish and, of course, generate employment, grow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. To give a few specific examples, you talked about the Reserve Bank. Would you believe that the strength of total strength of officers in the Reserve Bank has come down from around 9,000 when I left, which is about 2009-10? to around 7,000 now, uh, to around 7,000 now, um, in the last 10 years, during the period when the financial sector has expanded like mad. Now, you can't have effective, you can't have effective supervision, um, you know, unless you have a highly competent people using the best technologies available today for supervision, and be enough of them. We have fewer people than even small developed countries doing this. It is an unpopular thing to say these days that bureaucracy is too small. But it is. It is, because yes, it is. it is. That's right. India, Indian government is heavily understaffed. That's right. 
That's so absolutely right. Every sphere, heavily yeah. understood almost every sphere. Absolutely. Even the recruitment of the IAS IPS is smaller today than it was 10 years ago. Right. And population has expanded during this period tremendously. I mean, of course, right. the growth rate has been going down. But nonetheless, my, my point is not, I'm not saying, look, stuff the government with people. I'm not saying that, obviously. What I am saying is that we need to give much more attention to developing state capacity to do the things they're supposed to do, whether it is to deliver education, whether it is to deliver health, whether it is to deliver public infrastructure, whether it is to deliver regulations. You can't have it without without actually equipping the government to do this. And we are among, in, in, in that sense, uh, the least in the world. Um, and if you just take the size of our states, compare that with most countries in the world, and compare the governance in countries which are smaller than our states, and look at the expertise available at the state level. I'm not even talking about technocrats. I'm just talking about civil servants with domain ability. And so right. I think that this is a very important point, which needs to be brought on board. How you do it, only someone like NK can actually do, because he has the experience of running right. government at different levels. Mm. Right. Prachi, would you like to come in on this discussion? Anything you'd like to say? I agree with everything which Mr. Singh said and you know, Dr. Mohan said. I think the point I was making was slightly different. It's It, it was basically, you know, I mean, and the role of the regulator, which is exactly what Dr. Mohan said, is uh, is to enable the labor markets to function efficiently and to create a level playing field and support an environment for any you know entrants, new entrants to come in and the incumbents to flourish and promote a spirit of healthy competition at all levels. I think we know from the entire trade literature that how you know competition increases efficiency, productivity. So this you know uh, this was my you know, broader. Uh, idea and you know I agree with everything that has been said. Um, Mr. Singh, uh, I wanted to come back um, uh, to the issue of um, uh, structures of governance and, and incentives. Um, you know that when uh, a bureaucrat enters government, he or she faces a certain incentive structure. And when politicians enter government, they face a different incentive structure. Um, is there something in either of those, the structures, the incentive structures that they face, um, which leads them not to take major initiatives? Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll tell you in what context I'm raising this issue. In your final report uh, of the 15th Finance Commission, you have come out very explicitly uh, against centrally sponsored schemes. Uh, you've you've uh, you've uh, spoken against uh, these schemes and against their proliferation, and yet in the most recent budget, uh, there is actually a new centrally sponsored scheme which has come in in the arena of health, and it has not been merged with a pre-existing centrally sponsored scheme, namely the National Health Mission, which was already in existence, but it has just added one more in the same sector, which is health. So uh, what is there in the incentive structure within government, whether it's bureaucrats or politicians, that leads to the proliferation of centrally sponsored schemes? Uh, it is a question addressed to me. To you. Because you're so knowledgeable about government. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so let me tell you, um, first I want to fully agree with uh, what uh, Rakesh said. Uh, and you also uh, mentioned uh, Prachi in a different context, that uh, the ethos which has prevailed in the post-1991 has been to shrink government. And shrinking government has been a pursuit in the belief and rightly so at some levels, that government is overstaffed. Yes. But where I fully agree with Rakesh, I'll give you two important data. Rakesh mentioned some very important data on the Reserve Bank. Let me mention two important data. 
as part of the finance commission i had to visit all the state so indira would you believe what do you think is the number of doctors per thousand population in the poorest state of bihar which has the lowest per capita income is a next to negligible what do you think is the percentage of total number of policemen in a state which is our largest state and has some very serious law and order problems of and multiple challenges law and order not in any reflection on the governance because these are inherited legacy issues but uh, has certainly special uh, challenges looking at the uneven rates of development of the different region seen bundelkhand seen uttar pradesh it is a laughable it's far far less so what happens what do you think are the total number of primary teachers available in a state like bihar uh, and i'm not even going now into the quality of these primary teachers but in sheer sure. numbers how many more do you need you need several several million more the issue is how that is why i raised the issue that issue of growth in the belief that growth gives you revenues it's given you resources and by the way where i think rakesh you might want to put on your old hat and indira you too that this notion that government has driven not only in terms of shrinking its own uh, its own strength and size but has wanted all st st uh, state governments some national governments to emulate this let me yes. add to this uh, this particular thing that rakesh do you realize what an enormous harm this artificial distinction between revenue expenditure and capital expenditure has created do you, would you know in there which you know very well having been a member of a distinguished earlier finance commission that when we visit the states we compress the revenue expenditure to the extent possible and then we try to uh, see what revenue buoyancy is possible to try and minimize the incidence of the what has come to be known as the revenue deficit graphs in article 275 but do we realize that the modality which exists all teachers are revenue are, are revenue expenditure policemen revenue expenditure doctors revenue expenditure you mentioned uh, about the fact of why are we hang under centrally sponsored schemes on health it's a very legitimate question i'll address this in a minute but before that let me say that in when i did the analysis on the health sector one of the things i recognized is the regulatory regime of course is very weak we do not have an indian health service all doctors yeah. in states and prachi comes from a very distinguished family of uh, uh, her parents uh, being in the in the medical profession most doctors are on contract they are on a contractual appointment their incentive and security is very low the indian civil services act of 1951 said that there must be along with the indian foreign service and indian administrative service a national health service since 51 it has not been done there is a regulatory failure also do you realize that the amount of money which needs to go to the health sector is a laughable amount as rakesh knows very well today is 0.96% of gdp of which 0.72% is by the states and the balance less than 0.5% of gdp by the central government outlay what kind of health outcomes can you get really right. from minuscule out of this kind so you come back to the something which i raised you need more resources how do you get more resources you get more resources by way of improving your growth improving your revenue buoyancy improving your tax collection system and that i think but i where the end from where you began i agree with both you and rakesh fully that the end thing that the government need not shrink in fact 
we are understaffed and undergoverned in multiple ways at the cutting edge of Indian system at maintenance of law and order, security of life and property, availability of doctors to address health needs, availability of teachers to impart a quality education with improved outcomes than merely guaranteed access. So, I mean, all this to some extent are uh, look may look a little conflicting now. Uh, where Rakesh, I fully agree with, with Rakesh also uh, in another aspect, and Prachi uh, mentioned it uh, per se, is that, uh, just make one very brief comment on it, about regulators. You know, Rakesh, when we, uh, both you and I were partners in creating functions of regulators, but one of the lament is that there is no regulatory superintendence. The oldest regulator, or one of the oldest regulators, which goes before independence, is the Reserve Bank of India, of which you are a very core component. What do you think is the level of interaction? How many times does the Reserve Bank of India interact with people who make laws in India? The engagement and interaction of the regulator with parliamentarians is zilch, yeah. except on a rare occasion when he's when he's requested. It's not a very healthy tradition. The regulators in Indira we have created under separate acts of parliament, but there is no superintendence on the working of regulators. The annual report a regulator that not play things. I have a book chapter reforms the parliamentary system. Regulators who are today enjoying immunity under acts of accountability to power. Created the Reserve Bank, it has got its own check. But we encourage surety. We encourage all state governments to have of the regulator in state governments. He is appointed the state government, but he has zero accountability in terms of the tariff which he fixes, in terms of revision of tariff structures, in terms of enforcement of his tariff regulation, in terms of, of ensuring accountability to whom tariff is meant to be ensured, because this regulatory independence has degenerated in multiple ways. In some ways, yeah. government function with checks and balances, the regulators function with little accountability, but enjoying yes. immeasurable immunity. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Singh. I think we have um, uh, reached the time limit uh, given to us. Uh, we've actually crossed the official time limit by about 15 minutes, but the uh, discussion was so uh, enriching and engrossing uh, that I think they have allowed us to continue. Uh, warmest thanks uh, to the author for joining us and um, uh, reflecting on the current conditions uh, in the Indian economy with the wealth of the experience uh, that he has. Um, and thanks, of course, to Prachi Mishra and Rakesh Mohan for joining us as well, um, for, for bringing their thoughts uh, on the book and for engaging in, in such a fruitful discussion with the author. Prachi, you have a full working day uh, with the IMF ahead of you, I think. Do you? Or, or do you work during the day here? Today is actually President's Day, so today is closed. Oh, so it's off for you. Okay. Which, which president? <laughs> which president? <laughs> She's enjoying the holiday. Irrespective of the president, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prati. Thank you, Rakesh. Thanks, IAC. Thank you. Thank you very much.